Donald Trump and his defense team now objecting to several proposed special masters submitted by government prosecutors. We've got a pretty big, hefty docket update and several motions that we're going to take a look at here today. The big one that we sort of left off on the last time we talked about the docket update in this Trump case was about the special master. And remember, the judge came out and said to both sides, I want to know what you think the special master should do. And I want to know what you think the special master should do. And you guys come to an agreement, put them together and let me know. And that's essentially what happened here. So that's going to be the first joint filing that we look at. But then Trump is also simultaneously objecting to several efforts by the government. Remember that Donald Trump talked about that there was a motion to stay the appointment of the special master that the government filed. Trump responded to that. It's 21 pages. We'll look at that. And Trump is also objecting to several sort of suggestions that the government proffered that they think would be a good special master. And so we'll go through all three of these. Now, starting at the top, this is the docket. You can see we did a refresh before, before the show started. We've got several filings today, the 12th, the response filed by Christopher Kesey. He's the same lawyer, the newest addition to Trump's team. And then we also have this that was filed on September 9th. So that was on Friday. This was the government's response along with Trump's filing, the joint filing. And so both of those came out on Friday. Let's take a look at these a little bit closer and more detail. This document filed September 12th. You can see it's 21 pages long. Donald Trump versus the United States of America. And this is Trump's. No, actually, let's not start here. Let's start here. This is the joint filing. Yeah, let's start here today. This is the joint filing, Donald Trump versus the United States of America. The government prosecutors and Trump's defense team are coming together and they have this joint filing about the appointment of the special master. And remember, previously, the judge said, you guys get together and mash your heads and see what comes out of there. And they're filing this after that meeting. They said, okay, judge, look, in compliance with your orders, we actually did get together September 7th through September 9th, wonder what those meetings are like, huh? And here's what we've got for you, Judge. We've got a list of proposed special master candidates. We've got attachments of each party's detailed proposed order of appointment. And we've got substantive points that we're able to agree on and other issues that we're not able to agree on. Kind of covers the whole, all the bases there. So they start and they tell us, all right, well, here's who the government proposes. The government proposes two candidates and Trump proposes two candidates. The government received the plaintiff's proposed candidates shortly after 6 p.m. on the date of this filing. The government and the plaintiff will advise the court about their respective positions on the candidates on Monday, September 12th. And so we're going to take a look at Trump, Trump's filings objecting to those, and we'll see what the prosecutors look like another time. But here it says the government's proposed candidates. They tell us that they want this woman, Honorable Barbara S. Jones, retired, retired judge out of the Southern District of New York, partner in some LLP, and was already a special master, so she's got some experience. They also talk about this retired circuit court judge. His name is Thomas, also out of the D.C. circuit court. And, oh, he's a lecturer at Harvard. Great. So strike that guy for sure. Now, Trump's candidates are the Honorable Raymond Deary, Sounds like a very nice gentleman. Former chief judge of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York, served on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, formerly the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. We also have Paul Huck Jr., founder of the Huck Law Firm, former general counsel to the governor, governor and somebody over there in the state of Florida. Now, so you got these four candidates, and if you actually go over, there are other sort of uh, synopses that have been drafted up by other entities. So for example, the Epoch Times is one agent or is one organization that tells us a little bit more about these people. So for example, they tell us about Raymond for Trump's suggestion. They say Raymond began his federal service 1986. He was nominated by Ronald Reagan, confirmed by the Senate. He then became the court's chief judge. He had uh, handled a reduced caseload after he took senior status and so on. Also served on the foreign intelligence. So you can see who these people are right now. Let's see who one of the prosecutors are. These are Trump's choices, DOJ's choices. We have their first nominee was appointed by Bill Clinton, right? Barbara Jones presided over a wide range of cases, retired 2013, 
Before she became judge, she was an assistant and she was a special master in previous cases, one of them involving Rudy Giuliani. Right. So you, you sort of see the types of people that we're talking about, former judges, former experienced individuals. I don't want to belabor this because it's not all that interesting, but there are things that we will see that they're going to argue over as they come in from Trump's objection. So that's the people. Now, the people that are floating around, the names are very important, but also the scope. What are they going to be talking about? What's allowed? What's not allowed? And so then we get into this section, areas of substantive agreement. So Trump says, I'm good with this. Government prosecutors say they're good with this. The headings are as follows, reporting and judicial review. They agree on reducing the default 21 day review period. So to you know, re reduce the time from 21 days to 10 days, right? So they'll typically say a special master, that person has 21 days to do all this stuff. They say that's way too long, 10 days is good. Good with you, good with us, all right. Now, they, they, you can see this section is mm, uh, pretty uh, short, pretty small. So we have, uh, you can see here, page two, we got one, two, three, four sentences or four lines, really. Areas of agreement, five, six lines. And then we get seven, eight lines. And then we get areas of disagreement. Oh, yeah. So uh, this is going to go on for the rest of the document. <laughs> so they don't agree on anything. So let's start at the top. Now, they do agree that the special master may request the assistance of other people. Okay, so the special master can say, we need you and we need you to look at this. And they can go outside of the scope and go find other people. But that's about it. Okay, they agree this should go quickly and they agree that the special master should have help. That's about it. Then we get to what they disagree about. Areas of substantive disagreement between the parties. They say, here are the substantive differences here, Judge. The parties and their more detailed protocols set forth are, are listed out below. The government plans to make available to plaintiff copies of all this stuff. And they also say the government will return to plaintiff. So Trump is going to be getting back his personal items that were not commingled with records bearing classification markings. Footnote two, the government notes that such property was within the scope of what the search warrant authorized, right? They're saying, look, we got your passports. We got all this other stuff. We know that we don't need it. We know that we probably shouldn't have taken it, but we're not saying that we shouldn't have taken it admitting any fault or any wrongdoing, we could have taken anything because they could have, right? Because everything, the, the search warrant was so gigantically broad. They also tell us that duties and limitations, they have disagreements about this. The plaintiff's position, so Trump's position, is that the special master should review all the seized materials, including documents with classification markings. Trump wants them to look at everything. Trump also says that the special master should examine the documents to evaluate executive privilege claims. Look at privilege and look at confidential. Remember, these two things were big issues for us. The plaintiff does not believe, so Trump does not believe that the special master should or even have to consult with NARA, with the National Archives. So put them on their own. They don't have to go out there and commingle with NARA at all. To the extent that the special master determines such a need, Trump says the parties could be heard by the special master and this court before that step is taken. So Trump wants to sort of cordon off the special master, right? Don't let the special master go over to NARA and communicate. Now, the government says, well, the special master should not review those classified documents. You know, they should not adjudicate any claims of executive privilege. And they should submit to NARA any documents over which those claims are made. And they should consult with NARA on all the presidential records at all, right? So it's like the exact opposite of everything. The parties, writes the, the joint team parties, they say the parties generally agree on the categories of documents into which the materials to be reviewed should be allocated. But Trump originally identified five categories and the government four. The difference is only because they want separate, they separated personal items from personal documents. Okay, so uh, Trump had one additional category because he said personal items are different than personal documents and, you know, you can't put them in the same category. The government combines those two and then they assess executive privilege accordingly. Now, Trump believes that the government and their objection to the special master reviewing the documents is misplaced, right? So this is Trump's people speaking. They say, judge, the government incorrectly presumes the outcome, right? They say that their separation of these documents is inviolable. Second, their stance wrongly assumes that if a government, if a document had classification markings, it remains classified in perpetuity. That's not true, they say. 
And third, the government continues to ignore the significance of the Presidential Records Act. If any seized document is a presidential record, plaintiff has an absolute right of access to it while access by others, including those in the executive branch, have specified limitations. Thus, they say, Trump or his designee cannot be denied access to those documents, which in this matter gives legal authorization to the special master to take a look at those documents. Footnote three. And they say Trump anticipates filing a deeper analysis of these issues in the upcoming filing. So we're not done with this one there, Judge. Now, the principal difference, writes both sides, in the party's workflow is that Trump sends materials categorized by his lawyers directly to the special master, whereas the government proposes that it review the plain Trump's categorization by logs to determine if they disagree or disagree with the categorization. Okay, so it's all sort of technical. How is this going to go? Does it go from Trump's people to the special master? Does it go from the special master to the prosecutor, then to Trump? How does all this interface? That's what they're talking about. Now, they continue on. They talk about compensation. Trump says that they should evenly split the fees. It's going to be a lot of work, a lot of money on this thing. Think about this lawyer, this retired lawyer with all this, you know, litany of experience and FISA, this, that, and the other. They're probably billing, you know, a lot. So who's going to pay for all this? Well, Trump is like, well, well, I mean, you know, government is prosecuting me. Maybe they should pay for it all. But we'll split it evenly, the uh, professional fees and also the expenses of all of the expert consultants. Why don't we just split it? It sounds fair. It's like it's like going to lunch. But the government, because they hate Trump, says at the party requesting as the party requesting the special master, plaintiff should bear the additional expenses. Okay, so Trump should pay for it. You asked for it. You asked us out to lunch. So you're buying. And, you know, obviously they want to make him pay for it because it is one more tool that they can use to sort of bleed him dry of money. But number four, now they talk about the deadline. Okay, so the schedule for the review. The government wants a deadline of reviewing all of these documents by the end of October 17th, within which to complete the review process. But Trump says 90 days will be required given the volume of the documents. Okay, so fast forward 90 days from now, that's December. And they say, that's a lot of documents, but they say, you know, we're up to it. We're, we, can, we can have a conversation about this. We defer to the court and to the special master, not in any hurry either way. And so the parties now say, well, judge, we're available, right? This is our uh, brief. Uh, the government wants all these things. Trump wants all those things. Pretty big disagreements as to most of this stuff, right? In addition to uh, whether a special master should even be appointed at all, they are fighting about what the special master can do. The government says, no conversations or determinations about executive privilege and no discussions about or even a review of any documents that are deemed confidential or have the classification markings. So the government trying very, very hard to stop any oversight at every step. And we'll continue to see where this goes. But this is the joint filing and the judge will issue a response at some point and we'll continue to cover that. There's more filings. In addition, actually, let's start with here. Let's start here. Donald Trump is also objecting to several of the proposed special masters submitted by the government prosecutors. Three-page document, you can see Donald Trump versus the United States of America. Trump's supplemental pleading about the special master nominations. And so we just saw that the prosecutors submitted two people, retired judges. You know, not all that sort of interesting in terms of uh, being standout, you know, individuals. But they're very qualified because they've got all of this experience, retired years of practice in law. Many have special security clearances, have acted out as special masters before. And so they're, they're just you know very qualified people. But Trump is now objecting to several of those people. He writes, on September 9th, the government and us, we submitted the joint filing. In that submission, we indicated to the court our position on each other's candidates would be provided by September 12th. That day is today. Plaintiff objects, meaning Trump is saying, we do not think that these proposed nominees from the DOJ are appropriate. Trump says there are specific reasons why those nominees are not preferred for the special master in this case. Now, they write, as the court said in previous orders, that they required a list of proposed special master candidates, but did not specify whether that is to include specific advocacy as to why certain nominees are or are not suitable to serve a special master, they say Trump has construed that order in a limited fashion. So they're saying, Judge, you told us that you want sort of opinions on all this stuff. I don't know exactly how you want it. 
But here's what I'm going to be doing. I'm just going to submit this separately because I want to be a little bit more respectful to the candidates. They say, uh, Trump also submits, we're saying that, Judge, it's more respectful to the candidates from either party to withhold the bases for opposition from a public and likely to be widely circulated pleading. Therefore, they're saying Trump asks this court for permission to specifically express our objections to the nominees only at such time that the court specifies a desire to obtain and consider that information, right? And what they're saying, you know, before we move on, they're saying, judge, we think that these two candidates that you just saw are very, very problematic, right? But we're not going to blast the heck out of them in these public filings, right? We're just going to go ahead and let you know very politely, just like a little tap on the shoulder. We object to these candidates, but there is more to the objection. We're going to say this guy's a loser and he does this and he, you know, he cheats at cards and he also doesn't eat right. And, you know, he drinks 37 Coca-Colas a day and all of these things. But if they put it all out there on the public docket, then everybody's going to see that. And they're going to, can you believe what Rob does? That's, man, he's a loser, isn't he? And they don't want to do that. And so they're saying, judge, you know, look, can we just file this stuff separately? They say such information could be provided to the court in camera, meaning we could actually show you judge sort of off the record behind closed doors or pursuant to whatever procedure the court deems efficient and appropriate. Consistent with that approach, judge, Trump is willing to provide our specific rationale for supporting our nominees if and when the court deems appropriate. All right, so very polite, very nice, very gentlemanly. Well done there, Christopher Kesey, Trump lawyer, saying, you know, these guys are going to kind of be a big problem, Judge, but we can talk about it behind closed doors. You just let us know when you're ready, and then we'll blast them and tell you how incompetent and how big of losers they are. We also have another filing from this case. Previously, the government prosecutors said that they do not want a special master appointed. Now, the judge came out and said, that's too bad. I'm appointing one. And the prosecutors responded. They said, well, if that's the case, we're going to appeal this. We're going to take it up, judge, and you're going to come back and you're going to be in trouble. And they said, while that case is on appeal, judge, we're asking for a stay of your original order. Remember, the judge said special master is coming in hot. Stop what you're doing. They're saying, judge, hold on. You're going to about to be appealed. You're about to be overruled. And so while all of that is pending, why don't we just go back to the way things were? Why don't you stay your special master motion and let us get back to work? And they filed that motion and we read through it in detail. It was 20 something pages long. This is Donald Trump's response to the prosecutor's motion for a stay. Trump is objecting, saying, no, you already issued your special master order. So don't undo that. 21 pages, Trump versus the United States. This is Trump's response in opposition to the United States motion for a partial stay pending the appeal. Trump's defense team writes, this investigation of the 45th president of the United States is both both unprecedented and misguided. In what at its core is a document storage dispute that has spiraled out of control, The government wrongfully seeks to criminalize the possession by the 45th president of his own presidential and personal records. By way of its motion, the government now seeks to limit the scope of any review of its investigative conduct and presuppose the outcome, at least regards to what it deems are classified records, right? We're debating that. What are classified records? The government says, well, everything is, even your napkins. But Trump says, no, they're not. And so they want you to presuppose They're saying this is ridiculous. Trump's defense team says the court's order is a sensible preliminary step towards restoring order from chaos. The government should therefore not be permitted to skip this process and proceed straight to a preordained conclusion. Right. If they judge, they're saying, judge, if you appoint a special master and then you gut the special master duties, what's the point? And they're making debates about these classified records. We haven't litigated those issues yet. Trump's defense team says. They write, they reference this note from the court filing. They say the government's request with regard to this court order is twofold. Specifically, the government seeks a stay to the extent the order enjoins further review or use of the documents. And they also 
don't want the government to disclose those documents to the special master. So they're saying, stop both of those things. Now, Trump's defense is responding. He's saying accordingly. Your Honor, this request to stop those two things demonstrates the government has misinterpreted the order as a prohibition on conducting a national security assessment. That reading, however, is misplaced as the court order made clear that any such assessment may proceed. And they're right about that. Remember the ODNI? They were going to conduct the parallel review at the same time that the special master was coming in. It was a simultaneous analysis. And the judge said, okay, national security damage assessment. You can continue, but not this one. Now, the government, they write, generally points to the alleged urgent need to conduct a risk assessment, saying that if there was unauthorized disclosure of the classified records, we're all going to die. But the, prosecu- the, the Trump defense, they write, but there is no indication any purported classified records were disclosed to anyone. Indeed, it appears that the classified records, along with other such seized materials, were principally located in storage boxes in a locked room at Mar-a-Lago, so in a secure, controlled access compound utilized regularly to conduct the official business of the United States during the Trump presidency, which to this day is monitored by the United States Secret Service. This point we've made many times here. All of these people coming out, Anderson Cooper and Bill Barr, and they're sitting around there on these media shows and they're like, well, Donald Trump took documents to a resort in Florida. What a monster. Can you believe that? a resort in Florida. And we're sitting here going, uh, he was uh, down there all the time when he was the president. So it was okay back then for him to bring a briefcase down there, but now it's not, even though he's got continuing security clearances and secret service protection and all of the benefits of an ex-president. Ridiculous. And it's still secured by the secret service. And it sounds like they're even, it's even the same room, right? Controlled access compound utilized regularly to conduct the official business of the United States during the Trump presidency. It's the same room. So it was secure enough for the presidency and now it's all of a sudden, it's not like a beach closet, like there's beach towels in there or something, right? It's a bunch of old uh, uh, suntan lotion. Is this expired, honey? I don't know. They write, moreover, judge, the ultimate disposition of the quote, classified records that they say is everything And likely most of the seized materials is indisputably governed exclusively by the provisions of the Presidential Records Act. And the PRA accords any president extraordinary discretion to categorize all his or her records as either presidential or personal records. And we've talked about this. This is the Clinton sock drawer case that Judge Amy Berman ruled on back when Judicial Watch sued them for Clinton records. And he just said, oh, well, they're not presidential records. They're personal records. So we're good. And established case law provides for that and for very limited judicial oversight over such a categorization because otherwise the judge is more powerful than the president. The judge gets to decide, no, those aren't presidential records or those aren't personal records. Those are these, those are those, and these are those. Completely unenforceable. It's a separation of powers issue. Now you have a judge who says, oh, sorry, Mr. President, uh, you're going to jail now because I say that those in your sock drawer are different. It's ridiculous. And it's obvious when it's their person in charge, when it's President Clinton, they come out and they love it. Oh, no, we got to uh, make sure most uh, reverence and uh, it's the most powerful man in the country, you know, all that crap. But if it's Trump, they're like, no, those are our library books now. Those are, no, he's the president. He has the right to declassify, the right to declare them personal records versus presidential records. And up until this year, all of this was pretty established. Trump's defense says, the Presidential Records Act further contains no provision authorizing or allowing any criminal enforcement at all, which includes raids. Rather, disputes regarding the disposition of presidential records are resolved between the president and the National Archives. Thus, at best, the government might ultimately be able to establish certain presidential records should be returned to NARA. What is clear, like at best, okay, at best, things go back over there. You don't raid the the house. What is clear regarding all of the seized materials is that they belong with either Trump as his personal property or returned with NARA, but not with the Department of Justice, right? They had no right to come in there and seize any of that stuff. The law says so. They write, however, It is not even possible for this court or anyone else for that matter 
to make any determination as to which documents and other items belong where and with whom without first conducting a thoughtful, organized review. You can't know what should go in what bucket until you have a plan and do it thoughtfully. Recognizing this, they say, the court exercised, in this case, its equitable jurisdiction and its inherent supervisory authority to ensure that there was at least the appearance of fairness. At least the appearance is what the judge said like three times in her original order. Saying there's all sorts of problems in this case. You, DOJ, would be well served with at least the appearance of fairness because it doesn't look like that way to me. Saying these are extraordinary circumstances and we have to ensure the integrity of what's happening. Trump's defense says the government now advances the same arguments previously rejected in an, a new attempt to persuade the court. And for several reasons, the government has not demonstrated it's entitled to any relief. Now, this carries on. It tells us the government position incorrectly presumes the outcome, saying that these documents is a key issue. And so we're going to fast forward through a lot of this. You can see we're going to get into some heavy lifting where they're referencing the applicable law and all of the different case law, 1926. They say Trump's going to succeed on the merits. And we, we really went through this in detail at the, at the last time reviewing the government's original filing. And so basically this is responding to each one of those points. And to summarize, remember the, the government was saying this court doesn't have any equitable jurisdiction and a special master is not needed. And none of these things apply. And Trump is just responding, saying the appointment of a special master is in fact necessary. Yeah, it is a prudent step to preserve the integrity of the process. You know, the DOJ thinks that everything they do is all above board and everything's just completely perfect. That's not the case. Trump's defense says this court has provided more than adequate reasoning as to why a special master is needed to further review the documents are in question here. They say a special master is not an agent for President Trump or the government. The very purpose of a special master is to be a neutral third party. But they're melting down over this with the appropriate authorization reviewing documents to facilitate the resolution of the disagreements. In opposing any neutral review of the seized materials, the government seeks to block a reasonable first step towards restoring order from chaos and increasing public confidence in the integrity of the process. The government, writes Trump's team, also continues to assert that Trump is not permitted to claim executive privilege over any of the documents that they have in custody. And they say, Judge, though, you know, you've already expressed skepticism about this argument. And you wrote about that in your prior order. And so, Judge, with all of this in mind, it is appropriate that in these unprecedented circumstances to appoint a third party arbiter. Subsection C, they say that Trump, Trump has the power to declassify documents. And they're going back to that 1988 case, Navy versus Egan, which we've already talked about. Spent a lot of time on that one. President Obama enacted certain executive orders, they tell us. And a former president in another subsection has the unfettered right to access those presidential records. Ref, re, again, referencing the Presidential Records Act. Distinguishing between presidential and personal records. And here in the PRA, it tells us presidential records are defined as anything sort of taking place in the, in the duties of the president. But personal records are defined as this, documentary materials or anything that is a reasonably segregable portion thereof. Anything, right? Broad category. Uh, anything of a purely private, non-public character do not relate, have an effect upon carrying out the, the constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president. B basically, this is meaning that if, if one president is outgoing, you can't take the library books that the incoming president needs, right? Like if you have something that you know, like if you're out there with certain equipment and you're leaving the job site and somebody else comes onto that job site, they're going to need that equipment. If you take that equipment with them and they need it back, this is saying there are provisions that say that that is, that is sort of outside the scope of what they're talking about here. And so they tell us the presidential records act distinguishes presidential records from personal records. And there's, you know, whole, there's, here's a bullet, a, a bolded statement here. The categorization of the records during the presidency controls what happens next. They say the statute assigns the archivist no role with respect to personal records once the presidency concludes. There's no jurisdiction over any of this. 
The PRA contains no provision obligating or even permitting the archivist to assume control over those records. At the conclusion of the president's term, these are the only things that they can do. And they're referencing the President Clinton case right here. This quote comes from that Clinton sock drawer case, 2012, Judicial Watch versus National Archives. The judge writing in that case, the PRA does not confer any mandatory or even any discretionary authority on the archivist to classify records. Under the statute, the responsibility is left solely to the president. They say critically, Trump has the sole discretion to classify a record and and make a determination whether it's personal or presidential, citing the case law that we've already read through here. They continue. They say the government's not going to suffer any harm. Judge, if you appoint a special master, there's not going to be any problems with any of this stuff. They say that we're all going to die. Our eyeballs are going to melt out of our sockets if just somebody comes and holds their hand as they're rummaging through Melania's materials. But Trump says that's not true. They're not going to suffer any irreparable harm. It's ridiculous. The government ignores the distinction between different categories, saying they're looking backwards, not looking forwards, saying that, yes, there are circumstances where national security is important, but the court's order is already allowing the ODNI to go and review this stuff. The order does not prohibit the FBI from participating in the assessment. Thus, the government's concern that the FBI is prohibited from evaluating anything is unfounded. Judge, you carved out an exception for this stuff. So just stick with that. The operative language in the injunction is purpose. If an action's purpose is for national security, they can do it. If it's for criminal investigation, they can't do it. Easy. Just bifurcate the two. But they can't conflate the two together. And so they continue on. They say a brief delay is not going to cause irreparable harm to the government's investigation. Okay, they're not, they're going to be just fine. These documents sat around in Mar-a-Lago for almost two years. And there's not a meltdown. So just hold your horses over there. President Trump and the public would be harmed by the stay, right? Now we're flipping this around. Well, judge, it may, the government says it's going to hurt them. We disagree. But if you do not appoint the special master, it is definitely going to hurt hurt Trump and it's definitely going to hurt the public. And they say, judge, as you already pointed out, brilliant, by the way, incredible observation. They say, as this court correctly observed, a criminal investigation of this import, okay, an investigation of the former president of the United States by the administration of his political rival requires enhanced vigilance to ensure fairness, transparency, and maintenance of the public trust. They're referencing the judge. They say, judge, you said the investigation of a treatment of a former president is of a unique interest to the public and the country is served best by an orderly process that promotes interest and the perception of fairness. They write, as noted above, neither leaks nor the prospect of a public jury trial appear to raise any concerns about irreparable harm. Apparently, the only the secure review by a court-appointed and supervised special master is a risk to national security. Do you see that there? That's a little needle from Trump's defense team. They're saying, yeah, judge, you know, this is very curious here. Um, uh, You know, they are potentially charging Trump with a crime. And if that happens, uh, I've got grand juries involved. You've got all sorts of people prosecuting the crimes, but then you've got all of the agents involved. And then it goes to a jury trial where all of this material is going to be presented to everybody. And the government's not concerned about any of those other people. They're not worried about any of that. They're worried about some special master who's got all of this, these credentials, who's like, you know, retired and, you know, like been to the Super Bowl of law. You're concerned about them, but not all these jurors. Well, that's weird. They're saying that doesn't make any sense. So they say, given the significance of this investigation, judge, the court recognizes, as does Trump, that this must be conducted in public view. The court has correctly directed the commencement of a process which certainly benefits the government. President Trump and the people of the United States, the plaintiff here, Trump, respectfully submits that any stay of the injunction or any limitation on the scope of the review, judge, that you already ordered only serves to erode public trust and the perception of fairness. So judge, don't undo what you've already done. For the foregoing reasons, plaintiff respectfully requests the court deny the government's motion and uh, and allow the special master to get in there and do his or her job. 
Christopher Kesey, Lindsey Halligan, Evan Corcoran, James Trusty, all counsel for Donald Trump. And so the judge, of course, will issue a ruling. And let's, while we're here, let's do a quick refresh and see if the government submitted their... Yes, they did, actually. The government submitted their response. Let's take a quick look at this. And this one is four pages. So remember, Trump already objected to both of the candidates. The government responded. They said, the United States notice respecting the court's appointment of a special master. They say, we know that we're supposed to get this due to you by September 12th. In accordance with the representation, the government hereby tells the court they say the government submits the court should select one of the following three proposed candidates. Barbara Jones, which was theirs, Thomas Griffith, which was theirs, and the Honorable Raymond Deary. They say Judge Jones, Griffith, and Deary, they've got judicial experience. The government respectfully opposes Paul Huck, who does not appear to have the same experience. So the government understands that three candidates with prior judicial experience also employ staff who could help with some of this work. In selecting among the three, the government respectfully requests the court consider and select the candidate best performing, uh, best suitable to perform the job. Okay, so I think what that probably means is that this is an agreed upon individual. So I'm going to guess that if the judge is uh, listening to the parties, that the special master is going to be this guy, Honorable Raymond J. Deary. This was somebody who was proposed by Trump. Trump objected to both of the proposed candidates by the government, and the government did not object to both of Trump's candidates. They only objected to one. So it sounds like they both agree on the Honorable Raymond J. Deary, which sounds like a very nice gentleman. Sounds like a dear of a man. And so we'll continue to cover that. Now we'll see what the judge says. That came over from the official court docket, and so there's no new orders or rulings from the court today, but we will come back and cover those when they are revealed. And so those are the three big updates on the Trump docket, and we will continue to cover this case. So do not forget to subscribe and hit that like button as we continue to do so.